What's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I'm going to cover Guns, Germs, and Steel, my highlights from that book. Uh, in 2022, I really want to focus on expanding my worldly wisdom, reading outside of the investing arena, okay? And one of the best lists I've found out there for, you know, figuring out what to read to, to really develop this worldly wisdom across multiple disciplines is Lee Lu's recommended book list from his Himalaya Capital website. Uh, so this first section covers science, philosophy, evolution, history of human civilization, human history, okay? So I'm starting with the first one, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. So I took a bunch of notes. I'm going to share kind of the big ideas that I'm taking away from guns, germs, and steel uh, in this video. So let's dive right in. Uh, Jared Diamond, professor at UCLA, he's a biologist by training, okay? Uh, and he was studying birds in Papua New Guinea, and he was asked by someone there, why you white men have so much cargo and we New Guineans have so little, okay? And that really kind of struck Jared Diamond. He wasn't quite sure how to answer that. Of course, cargo really means material things, right? Um, so Jared Diamond set out on this mission to try to figure out, you know, what's, what's a good answer to that question? Why, you know, some societies have progressed much faster than others. Um, so here's my highlights from Guns, Germs, and Steel. 13,000 years ago, okay, we had the, the ravages of the last ice age had just ended. The world was getting warmer and wetter. Uh, so predominantly, you know, you've got hunter-gatherer society, kind of small hunter-gatherer bands uh, around the world 13,000 years ago. The issue is hunting is, is not a very reliable way to find food, okay? It's kind of a crapshoot. Uh, most societies relied more on the gathering uh, end of the hunter-gatherer spectrum um, because, well, it, it's a little bit more reliable. The problem is it still doesn't provide enough calories to support a large population. Okay, so you've got these wandering bands of people uh, really just trying to find food. That was kind of the predominant occupation 13,000 years ago. Now, uh, 11,500 years ago, in an area known as the Fertile Crescent, uh, a village was discovered by archaeologists uh, with grain storage. Okay, it was kind of the first documented grain storage 11,500 years ago. Uh, and it was wheat and barley that was being stored uh, in, in this area. Uh, so people were growing their own food next to their village for the first time. Uh, so this was, this was a huge thing, right? Farming, the birth of farming. Uh, people cultivating seeds, saving seeds, harvesting, uh, growing food next to where they live and kind of having a, a permanent um, home. Right, a permanent village where they didn't have to move around to find food. Um, and of course, over time, you know, as these these seeds are being sown and the harvest, you're you're selecting for the best uh, varieties of the crops. Over time, you've got uh, better and better quality uh, crops that are coming out of this. And this is known as domestication. Um, the transition to farming was clearly a decisive turning point in history. People who remained hunter-gatherers couldn't produce anywhere near as much food as farmers. They also couldn't store it for very long, okay? Uh, wheat and barley that were kind of found in the wild uh, in the Fertile Crescent had this quality where they could be stored for quite a long time, provided you've got uh, kind of the right temperature and humidity uh, set up which you know, they were able to control uh, to an impressive extent uh, in, in this 
had a grain storage system that was unearthed from 11,500 years ago. Uh, so farming developed independently in the Middle East and in China. In China, it was uh, based on rice. In the Middle East, it was based on wheat and barley. Uh, it also developed in the Americas independently. That was corn, squash, and beans. Uh, later in Africa, sorghum, millet, and yams. Uh, in most places where farming emerged, a relatively large advanced civilization followed. Okay, so farming enabled a smaller portion of the population to produce the food, and it freed up uh, a bunch of people to, to be able to pursue other interests, not um, have to farm for, for you know, the, their full-time occupation anymore. Um, so people around the world who had access to the most productive crops became the most productive farmers. It came down to geographic luck, okay? And this is really the, the big idea, one of the big ideas from Jared Diamond. Why did some societies progress much faster than others? Geographic luck, okay? They happen to have these crops crop up there um, that you know, were, were great food uh, and could be cultivated and farmed year after year. Uh, so that's, that's the plant piece of the puzzle, okay? Uh, there, there's another piece of the puzzle. 9,000 years ago uh, is when we found evidence that humans had started domesticating animals, okay? So you've got crops and now you've got animals coming into the picture controlling their movement. So they're no longer hunting, having to follow these animals, right? That are kind of moving about freely. Uh, they can actually confine the animals and keep the animals close to the village. Uh, so controlling the movement, controlling feeding, controlling breeding, okay? Uh, and then you have more products than just meat that you would have as a hunter. You've got milk, you've got hair, you've got skins. You'd have hair and skins as well as a hunter, but you wouldn't have milk, okay? I don't know anybody, anybody out there who is hunting saying, hold on, let, let me milk you first, and then, and then we'll do the whole meat thing. Um, so, you know, big development there with the domestication of animals. And of course, crops and animals were complementary, okay? Which is a beautiful synergistic uh, relationship there, where with the crops, you know, say you have a big harvest, uh, more food, more grain than the people need, you can feed that grain to the animals, okay? So you can kind of uh, level up the quality of the food by feeding that grain to the animals and then uh, consuming the animals. And of course, the animals produce uh, poop, right? Manure uh, that can be used to enrich the crop fields. So um, very synergistic relationship between domesticated plants and animals. Uh, goats and sheep were the first animals to be domesticated. And of course, animals were also used to plow the fields, right? Animals were used for muscle power. Uh, cattle and horse, horses uh, per particularly. Um, so, you know, you can get so much more yield out of a field if you're using animal power to, to plow these things and, and seed them versus just human power, okay? So that is another thing that allowed uh, fewer and fewer people to produce the food for the community and, and free up other people to pursue um, other interests. Now, the best animals to farm are large plant-eating mammals, okay? Uh, they need to be social animals with an internal hierarchy, which means if you can control the leader, if humans can control the leader, you can control the whole herd, all right? So that just uh, is a huge advantage in terms of, you know, having animals near the village. Um, there were only 14 large animals that have successfully been farmed, okay? 14 domestic large animals in 10,000 years of domestication. 
maybe even 11,000 years. Um, none of them were native to Australia or Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? Um, none in North America. South America had an ancestor of just one of these large domesticated animals, and that was the llama. And of course, with the llama, you know, you're not getting uh, work power there. You're not getting uh, muscle power to, to plow the fields. Um, you know, you, you have meat. I don't think you have milk from llamas. You know, I, I heard once you could milk anything with nipples, but I've never heard of llama milk. Um, so the jury's still out on that one. But in South America, you've got one. Okay? You've got at least, you've got one ancestor of these uh, large domesticated animals in the llama. The other 13 were all from Asia, North Africa, and Europe. Okay. Um, so, and the big four, of course, cows, sheep, pigs, and goats were native to the Middle East. So here you've got these incredible crops, right? These incredible grain crops uh, that have started to be domesticated. And then you've got the big four livestock animals, a cow, sheep, pigs, and goats, which are also, you know, in a sense, native to the Middle East. Uh, so that's, that is a huge stroke of geographic luck right there. Um, so freed from the burden of farming, some people were able to develop new skills and new technologies. Uh, understanding how to work with fire was the first step towards forging steel, a technology that would transform the world. Uh, of course, guns, germs, and steel. Um, so with steel came swords, guns, typewriters, trains. Okay, there's just a, a boom of technologies that emerged from this understanding of making this incredible metal, this, this steel. It's very durable, um, very useful metal. Um, let's see, within a thousand years of their emergence, most of the villages of the Fertile Crescent were abandoned. Okay, the climate was too dry and the ecology was too fragile. Really, the truth is the people just didn't understand uh, how to farm there in a way that was sustainable, right? They turned what was once kind of a rich area, right? The Fertile Crescent into a desert because um, they just didn't manage the resources properly. Um, yeah, so here's a very important point uh, of guns, germs, and steel. If we look here at a map of the world, right? Uh, fertile Crescent, somewhere in here. So if you look at this, you can see East and West, there is a lot. There is a lot of room to expand, right? All right, we've 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 totally messed up the resources, right? The natural resources in the Fertile Crescent, but we can go East and West very easily. Uh, that turns out to be incredibly important um, for the spread of, you know, this, this, these Euro, this European, uh, Middle Eastern culture that originated here in the Fertile Crescent, that they were able to spread east and west. Um, and the reason for that is east and west, you've got a similar climate, okay, because you're traveling along the same latitude, uh, which means you've got similar day lengths in the summer and winter, uh, similar temperatures. So there's a lot, there's a lot of advantages in terms of domesticating crops and animals and being able to spread east and west where those crops and same crops and animals are still likely to thrive uh, versus having to go north or south into different climates. Uh, and we'll get more into that in a little bit here. Uh, let's see. Uh, next one. So the Spanish conquistadors conquered the Incan Empire, okay? Uh, you've got the, the Spanish came down, you know, I don't know which, they must, they must have gone around. Um, over here, Peru, the Incan Empire. Um, so, 
right? In the New World here, North America, South America, Central America, all the farming had to be done by hand. Like I said, they weren't strapping, um, you know, plows to the llamas. Um, now, Europeans had produced the ultimate transmitter of knowledge, okay? And this really played a factor when the Spanish conquistadors uh, went to war with the Incan Empire. Um, the Spanish had the huge advantage of being able to read from, from other explorers uh, what happened, how they conquered uh, different, different tribes of the world, different native peoples of the world. It was written, right, uh, in these books from the printing press. So the Spanish knew uh, how, how everything went with um, the Aztecs, right? The conquest of Mexico through books, okay? Uh, so that gave them a, a big advantage when they came across the Incan Empire. Um, we're able to, with many, many fewer um, people on the battlefield, they were able to uh, take the Incan Empire. Um, so, you know, can't, can't, and, and, you know, the, the, there was writing, there was writing, uh, with the Aztecs, uh, there was writing with the Incan Empire to an extent, uh, but they weren't communicating with each other. And the reason, again, is geography. Uh, they weren't traveling north and south. It, it's much more difficult to travel north and south, uh, because, again, you're encountering different climates where, the crops that you've cultivated for thousands of years um, aren't going to transport that way very well. They're not going to tolerate, uh, you know, going from around the Tropic of Cancer down past the equator, right? Uh, it's just too much, too much change in terms of what, what plants can grow. Um, so that's why writing didn't spread from Mexico south to the Incan Empire. Uh, the Spaniards possessed another weapon they didn't even know they had. Okay, this gets into uh, the germs piece of guns, germs, and steel. A weapon of mass destruction that had marched invisibly ahead of them. So smallpox had been brought to Mexico 12 years before Pizarro arrived uh, from a Spanish ship with an infected slave. Okay. Uh, now, the smallpox really decimated uh, the populations of the New World. Now, why is that? Why did it not affect the Europeans as much as uh, the people who were native to North and South America? And the reason for that is these killer diseases of humans evolved from the germs of domesticated animals. Okay, it was spread... Uh, from the, the, the livestock to the, the people who were, you know, living in the villages that were, um, you know, managing these livestock. And so over many, many generations of dealing with these domesticated animals in Europe and the Middle East, people developed these resistances to these diseases, okay? Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of disease in, in Europe, um, over, you know, the whole history of from, from 11,000 years ago where, when animals were first domesticated. Uh, terrible, terrible plagues, terrible uh, disease epidemics. Um, but of course, the humans that were able to survive those uh, had, you know, the, the right genetic makeup to be able to do that and, and of course would pass those genes on. So that's how you've got this, this slow uh, resistance to these type of diseases that, that came from livestock uh, in the European stock, whereas you know, in the New World, they had never seen these diseases before. So it was much more, um, much more brutal for, for uh, the, Inc the Incan Empire, the Aztecs. Um, yeah the Europeans were more resistant and the new world had no natural immunity 
to these things. Um, so, okay. Makes sense. Europeans were able to conquer the New World North and South America. What happened when guns, germs, and steel came to Africa? Okay. Uh, a little bit of a different story there. And there's a couple of factors that made it a different story. Um, I believe it was the Dutch that landed in South Africa. Okay. Um, and they started marching north. Now, you guys probably already see where this is going, but as the settlers move north beyond the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, right here, things started to go downhill. Uh, their crops failed. Their crops weren't suited to, to this uh, warmer and wetter climate, this, you know, uh, summer dry season and then this monsoon season. This is completely different climate. So the crops weren't doing well, uh, the animals were dying, uh, the settlers were, were falling ill. Um, so it was, it was kind of flipping the tables in a lot of ways. Whereas with the Europeans uh, invading North and South America, the, the, everything was on the side of the Europeans. And now that's, that's flipping a little bit here. Uh, in terms of the germs, anyway, and the climate for cultivating the, the crops and, and the animals. Um, fevers racked the population, yet the tropical Africans showed fewer of the same effects. Many of them even survived smallpox, which is really interesting. And part of the reason for that is there were cows uh, in Africa, okay? So native Africans had had exposure to, to domesticated animals as well. They were domesticating uh, their own animals. And so perhaps they had also built up some of this resistance through that relationship uh, over many generations. Um, but also you've got malaria, okay? Malaria was a huge issue. It was really decimating um, the you know, the Dutch that were really trying to uh, conquer this, this new territory. Uh, they had never encountered these diseases before. It was a complete reversal of the usual pattern of conquest. Uh, and I mentioned the cattle, African cattle had developed resistance to many of these tropical germs. Malaria was overwhelming Europeans. Uh, the entire African civilization had evolved to help them avoid diseases like malaria. Okay, so... Africans were well aware. They were very familiar. They were designing their villages um, really with malaria at the forefront. So the villages, they were settling in high and dry locations away from mosquito breeding grounds. They were living in small communities spread out over vast areas right, to reduce the transmission of malaria between people. So they had multiple strategies to try to reduce uh, this exposure to malaria. Uh, Europeans had failed to settle the African tropics, uh, but still wanted to exploit the resources, right? Very resource rich, uh, this, this African continent. So there, were cop there was copper, diamonds, gold, in the late 1800s, the Belgians drove millions of native Africans from their villages, forcing them to ferry Africa's natural wealth back to Europe via railroads and slave labor. Okay, so, you know, the Europeans said, all right, we don't want to live here, right? We, we, it, it's not working, right? We're all dying. Our, we can't grow food. Our, our animals are dying, but we still want to exploit the resources of Africa. So we're going to build railroads. Uh, from South Africa into the heart of Africa so that we can pull those resources out using the labor of the people who are native to Africa. Uh, so that's, that's the story there. Uh, the 1% negative growth each year in Africa over the last half century can be attributed entirely to malaria. Okay, so malaria, I don't know how many of you guys have been to Africa, but and this isn't true everywhere in Africa, but malaria, huge issue, huge issue in Africa. Uh, I have a friend who travels to Africa quite often and, you know, constantly 
anti-malarials. That, that is the first thing she's taking before she goes. Um, the population densities introduced by European influence have helped malaria spread faster, okay? So the native Africans, they had ways of dealing, ways of coping with malaria to try to, you know, mitigate the effects. And of course, the Europeans come in, they say, no, you guys are going to live in cities. Like, everything's got to be like it is in Europe. This is how it's going to be. And of course, that was terrible uh, for the spread of malaria. So uh, it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty sad story. Um, you know, North America, South America, Africa. You know, the Europeans, they, um, they really figured out how to just take over everything, really just uh, extract as much value as possible um, from the rest of the world. And, you know, Ian Morris's books, at least Why the West Rules for Now, gets into this as well. Why was it the Europeans uh, instead of Asia? Okay. Why was it the West instead of the East that really conquered the world? Um, and his point there, I'll just share real quick. It's about 3,000 miles from you know, say England to the United States, 3,000 miles by ship. Now, if you're trying to get there from Asia, it's, it's like 8,000 miles, okay? So there was a huge advantage in terms of proximity uh, to, to get to these places by boat. As you can see, I mean, Europe, it, it just has to, you just have to cross the Atlantic. Whereas Asia, the Pacific, it's, it's so much bigger. Anybody who's flown from the Europe to the States and then from the States to, you know, Australia or, or Asia knows, I mean, very different, very different situation. So, uh, that's, uh, Ian Morris would say that's in large part why the Europeans, uh, really came to dominate, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the Asian countries. Uh, so I just want to throw that little nugget in there. And yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of a summary of guns, germs, and steel. Um, so big hat tip to Li Lu for putting this list together. I'm going to work my way through it. I don't know if I'm going to make a video for each of these books, um, but it's kind of my quest in 2002 to uh, expand my worldly wisdom. Take, take a step back a little bit from investing books and uh, try to learn the big ideas across many different disciplines. Um, biology, evolution, physics, you know, philosophy, history. There's so many things to learn. Psychology. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you did, there's, there's going to be a lot more coming around this. Uh, and check out Lilu's book list. Uh, Lilu, you know, one of the investors I hold in highest regard. So... Um, definitely a great place to figure out what you might want to read next. So check that out. And uh, I'll leave it there, guys. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Take care.